Text-to-post text people is what they had at mine, yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds like some kind of hateful slur thing, just text-to-toasty, as somebody who's not from this country. No, it's like just like, free... You can't call people toasties. Hey, welcome to Beer Christianity. My name's John T. I'm Laura. I'm Malky. And I'm Alex. Hey. Alex, hi. Welcome to Beer Christianity. Can you introduce uh, the listeners to you, tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Alex. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm just over 30 uh, and I'm a minister. So I'm an ordained minister in the United Reformed Church. Um, and I'm also transgender and non-binary. Um, so I transitioned towards male quite a long time ago now, kind of 13, almost 14 years ago. Um, and I live as non-binary, which means that that I kind of experience life beyond um, the, the binary genders of male and female. Um, but for me, what I'm really passionate in is in reaching out to people who aren't really engaged with church. Um, so my current ministry is working in Cambridge City Centre, um, working with adults in the kind of millennial age group, which is kind of late 20s to late 40s now, um, and kind of looking at actually what's it mean for us to create an authentic faith life, um, particularly when quite, quite a lot of us have experienced pain, really, at the hands of, of faith institutions, then we're working out what to do with that. There is so much to unpack in that. So we're going to have to try really hard not to go over time. Um, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to talking about it. But I first just I thought it would be wrong for us not to note for the readers. Readers? Yeah, the readers. <laughs> the readers of our souls, the listeners, uh, how <laughs> much I could see Laura's soul die a little bit when you described millennials. <laughs> no, it was because I saw John T smiling when you said millennial because we had been having this argument literally just before you joined the call about how um, John T thinks I'm a, I'm a millennial and I would argue that I am not. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but by looks I'm thinking you're younger than a millennial. Yes, this is I what she wanted. Disclose no more information. <laughs> I have got what I came for. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that is the first, you know, of many hopefully identities affirmed within this. Yeah, this thing. Very that's fantastic. Affirmed. It's really great. <laughs> so good. Um, uh, okay, so. Uh, you started off by telling us uh, your pronouns. This has become something of, in on the right particularly, something that seems inexplicably to enrage people if somebody tells people their pronouns, and particularly if they're they, them, or if they are not the uh, gender that they were assigned at birth. Um, do you have any kind of sense of why this bugs people so much? Does it really bug them, or are they pretending that it bugs them? I think, in a way, it's kind of become a symbol. Um, and it's assumed that if people use pronouns like mine, pronouns like they, them, um, or non-binary pronouns, that maybe it's trying to say something political um, or trying to make a point. And I've thought about it a lot over time. And I used to use he, him pronouns when I first transitioned. I then moved to he, they. And what I found really difficult was that when I used he, they, no one used the they at all. People just used he. Um, and I was kind of thinking about, well, why does this annoy me? And what I realized is because I felt like people weren't seeing the truth of me. Um, there's something ostensibly true about the fact that I'm non-binary. And for me, using pronouns other than he or she um, recognizes that. And I guess I just felt really sad that people didn't feel able to see or recognize kind of the fullness of who I am because I'm quite an open and authentic person. Um, and I wanted people to be able to engage with that. So that that's become increasingly important to me. And it's become increasingly important to say, I'm not trying to make a statement. I'm just trying to let you see me. And that seems to be, you know, the thing that we hear again and again from trans people and queer people generally. It's just like, I'm, I'm just trying to exist as me and have nobody attack me for that. Like it doesn't seem to be asking a lot. Yeah, I saw a quote um, yesterday on social media that said um, the trans agenda is a normal life expectancy. And I thought, like, that's so true. And then one of my friends commented, yeah, and a normal life. Yeah. Um, and I think both of those facts are really true. We just want to live and just want to, like, live just like anyone else. So identifying as non-binary um, and, and, and being in that kind of space from from a young age like like what was that like um so at a very young age i kind of 
literally had no way to know who I was. And that was very, very painful and difficult. Um, so I went to an all girls school and I didn't really have a lot of peers my own age who weren't female. Um, and because of that, I just felt completely isolated. When I'm talking to groups of children and young people, I talk about literally thinking I was an alien when I was a child. It was that sort of, well, surely I'm going to be kind of beamed up and taken to this place where I belong. Um, I used to, I don't know if you guys know the Tracy Beaker series, which is all about um, a kid in foster Mate, care. Do I know the Tracy Beaker series? Oh my goodness. Sorry. Yeah, Carry I know. On. It's really good. <laughs> don't get us started. <laughs> don't get me started, honestly. <laughs> So I used to watch that and read that and be like, yeah, that's me. I must be like a foster kid or my parents are probably going to listen to this and be really offended. But I just literally felt like for some reason I didn't belong and I could not comprehend what that reason could possibly be. I now kind of look back on that as an adult and I'm kind of like, oh, gosh, I was clearly quite depressed and quite alienated. And actually, that's quite disturbing to think of a child feeling that way. Um when I moved, so when I was 12, I was offered a place in a specialist music school. And I think everyone thought I was really excited about going to music school, but I was mostly excited because it was a mixed school. Um, and pretty much immediately, as soon as I started going there and mixing with boys my age, I was like, oh yeah, I'm a boy. Um, it, it was just that kind of natural or intuitive. But unfortunately, I didn't know that trans people existed. Um, I think I'd been introduced kind of to the idea of cross-dressing and the idea that that was okay, but nothing beyond that. It wasn't nearly as visible um, as it is currently. So for context, the first trans guy um, on TV was in Hollyoaks um, and was when I was around 19. Um, so after I'd already come out. So there was just no um, representation at all for me to recognize myself in. And so I thought there must be something wrong with me. How can I think I'm a boy? So I just didn't tell anyone at all. Um, for a while, I just dealt with it completely internally and had a lot of mental health difficulties as a result and also social difficulties. Um, and then eventually I came out as lesbian, not because I was experiencing attraction to women or had any kind of sense of sexuality at all at that point. I'd much more kind of fit into an asexual category. Um, but because I'd recognized that... Um, gay women seem to be permitted to present in a more masculine way, which I now know to be a massive stereotype, but that was what was going on around me. So that was the only way I felt I could be myself. Um, so that was kind of when I came out for the first time. And it wasn't until I went to an LGBT youth group at university, age 17, that I met other trans and non-binary people. And I describe it as kind of being like looking in a mirror, really, because there was just that immediate sense of recognition and sense of, yeah, this is who I am. Um, it just made sense. And it was like a feeling of wholeness that I hadn't really experienced at all until that point and kind of a feeling of, I guess, almost peace of some sort. And you, you're a URC minister now. Like, did your faith journey, what was that? At what, at what points did that parallel? Did it, did they intersect at all? Yeah, massively. So, in a way, faith was assumed for me as a child. Um, my dad was a Church of Scotland minister, um, so it was kind of natural that I went to church. And I, But beyond that, I did actually have quite a strong personal faith as a child and a sense that God was there, and particularly a sense that like, in engagement with nature, I felt like I was engaging with God. Um, and also in music, I'm a, I play Clarsach, which is the Celtic harp. Um, and that was kind of my way of prayer and meditation, really, um, as a child. My dad then moved into chaplaincy, which meant that we lost our kind of automatic church home. And all of my family um, kind of gradually stopped going to church. And I started going to a church that was a big, lively church with really great music and a lot of young people and pastors who wore T-shirts. And you can probably tell where I'm going with this. T-shirts. Um, yeah, it was not good. <laughs> so it was kind of okay for about a year. And then I went on a mission trip, in inverted commas, um, to Kenya, during which people were talking about who they were attracted to. And I admitted being attracted to a girl, kind of genuinely not realizing it was going to be a big thing. And it was a big thing. And some really bad stuff happened and I was chucked out. Um, 
So I ended up not going to church for a good couple of years until I went to university um, and found the university chaplaincy, which was tied with a, a more inclusive church and kind of encouraged me to read scripture for the first time by myself. Um, and that process kind of ended up going alongside and being quite intertwined with the process of my transition, because that was around the same time that I met other trans people for the first time. And there was a sense in which being able to honestly read scripture was, I guess, tied up in being able to honestly read and understand myself. So for example, reading Genesis 1 and understanding that initial human being as both containing all of and being beyond gender just came quite naturally to me. I didn't have to study to think that. It just made sense with who I was finding myself to be. So there was this process of discernment, really, that was about faith and about who I was all at the same time. And, the Oh, sorry, go. <laughs> and, you know, going on what we've been speaking about, about kind of how people have been, how people react with, with pronouns and kind of labels. Um, as someone who has been able to have I don't know whether you would call it a freedom, but to kind of be able to shift identities as you have kind of grown and learned about yourself. How, yeah, how has that been? How has that kind of journey of yeah shifting been? Yeah, um, it's been easy in some ways and challenging in others. I think in kind of faith spaces, um, generally things have been positive in the kind of faith face to face spaces that I'm in and like the spaces that I'm really engaged in. Um, I guess that's partly because of the spaces that I choose to engage with. Um, and people have generally recognized me as I am. The church that I currently work out of, um, there are some people who admit struggling with pronouns, but they're trying. And actually, that's what I want. Like, I want people to call me they sometimes if they get it wrong. Other times, personally, that's okay for me. Um, but I get a lot of hate from fake spaces that I'm not that engaged with. Um, so I get kind of emails, letters, tweets pretty much daily. Um, and we've also got a local colleague who's started getting like tracts from a evangelical charity sent to my workplace, um, which is a bit of an odd one. Uh, so I kind of, it's frustrating because the people that I engage with day to day, it's completely fine. Um, but then every single day, there are all these other people who I don't know who have an issue with it. Um, in terms of beyond faith spaces, um, the people I'm still engaged with have been really great. Again, a lot of people struggle to get my pronouns right all the time, but that's okay. Um, the people who weren't so great kind of dropped off quite near the beginning of my transition. Um, and most of them, it was related to faith or church in some way. So were you able to, um, I guess it was quite a broad brush that you skipped over. A lot of traumatic stuff there <laughs> but um but like it feels like you were able to kind of um um separate the people from god or the church or faith like was that was that easy to do did you think ah these people are wrong or oh this is how god feels about me or yeah so i think i think it kind of helped that at the time i was 15 um I was a goth. I was very anti a lot of yes. things. I was quite angry. Um, and like, I kind of just decided that church was a load of crap, to be honest. Like, I just thought, well, church clearly isn't on God's side because I experienced God as being something or someone that I connected with on a kind of intuitive level. And I'd never felt that hatred or dismissal or judgment from God. So for me, and I guess sometimes I'm maybe too good at putting things in a box, but church kind of got put in a separate box from God. Um, and so it was kind of a relief to then find a church that I thought was along the same lines as God, because, because those traumatic experiences were, were the first time I'd heard that church could be anti-LGBT. It kind of shifted my perspective to assuming that the whole of church was like that. Um, and that therefore church was totally out of step with God. So to be able to then go to a church that was like, oh, okay, um, this makes more sense to me. And I think, I guess I'm quite lucky that just because of something in my 
psychology maybe or my spirituality I have that sense of connection and I think a lot of the young people who I talk to who have had similar experiences in church if they don't have that sense of connection then it can just be completely devastating um and don't get me wrong it was difficult like I experienced really severe anxiety um to the extent that that doctors thought maybe I'd got malaria or something like that so I had like loads of blood tests and things because I was so ill um, and it turned out it was anxiety because of how I'd been treated. So it did have effects, but at least it didn't make me feel like God hated me. Um, but I know a lot of people who do feel like God hates them. Um, and still, like, they may be back in church or they may have found their own journey, but they still think intuitively that God hates them. And I just, I can't even fathom how awful that is. As, as somebody who's passionate about kind of reaching out to people, um, that must, uh, you know, that must be just so, so sad because I just think, I always think of the the super conservative church that I was in when I'd just become a Christian when I was 18, and they had this massive focus on uh, evangelism and on getting people to a point where they could come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this seems to be, this attitude to trans people or to queer people generally seems to be a guaranteed way almost to make sure that people are driven away from that, to put like this huge stumbling block. Like, is it, 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 as, a, as a minister, doesn't that, I mean, it must irritate you, obviously. That's such yeah. a massive, I mean, it's one of the things that feels kind of ironic. Like, there's part of me that doesn't want to give churches that are hurting people tips but I occasionally just kind of think like tactically even if you want to believe all of this stuff and even if you want to persuade people of all of this stuff at some point immediately making them feel unwelcome means that they're never going to hear what you think anyway so yeah. what's the point in doing that it's not going to evangelize people um I so someone I met quite early in my current role um had stopped going to church altogether and I asked him why, and he said he was fine until he went to university. And then he came to university and the Christian Union had this thing where you could phone for a slice of pizza during Freshers' Week. But the caveat was that you had to ask them one question. And he decided to ask them why they liked Jesus, because it seemed like a logical thing to ask the Christian Union. Um, so they came to his house with this pizza and their initial answer to the question was, well, we have we don't like Jesus but we have to follow Jesus because otherwise we're going to go to hell. They then spent an hour telling him how awful that was going to be. And the way he described it was, and then I was left sitting there with really cold, soggy pizza and this kind of existential dread. And I thought, why would I ever go to church? Yeah. And I thought, yeah, he was fine until that one encounter, which was just so rubbish that there was yeah. no getting beyond it. That's like well, the Threads Terms of Service trying to keep you subscribed. It's just like, that's like, that's not sales. That's, yeah. I was that pizza delivery boy. Like, not the actual one, but like, yeah. But he did it. Yeah, he did it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've done some repenting and some deconstructing. But yeah, I was the UCCF um, guy. And we did, um, yeah, one of the unis I, I worked at. Um, it was Texter Toasty. Texter Toasty was what they had at mine, yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds like some kind of hateful slur thing, just Texter Toasty, as somebody who's not from this country. No, it's like just like, free... You can't call people Toasties. I don't but know where also... they're from. I don't know what their identity is, but don't call them Toasties. It's hateful. We also had, at school, this is a complete tangent, but we had Grilla Christian. Which was like you would get very narrow. <laughs> which <so>. yeah. <laughs> but it was such you could just go and ask them loads of questions. But it was like, why like that's a weird phrase. <laughs> yeah, we we did that as well. Grill Christian. Yeah. You can ask us questions, but we are not going to be listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are gonna get you in a room and we are gonna tell you what the gospel TM oh, is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's that TM thing that's difficult, I think, because we all have such different experiences that when it's kind of on company line, it's a bit challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So, go Sorry. On. Well, I was just going to, that like, yeah, that's the real difficult thing for me now. I don't, I'm not in those circles anymore, really. Um, apart from like, yeah, vague people when I 
venture back onto Facebook. Um, but I think that would be my one criticism of kind of UCCF in particular, or that kind of um, conservative perspective, that it's so narrow, like, and and exclusive. It's because, I mean, we, I remember working with, um, or, or trying to work with um, chaplains who are based in um, universities, but often someone else would get there, you know, someone in the CU already would be like, oh yeah, they're a liberal. Like there's just no, you know, so like those lovely folks that you described as being affirming or whatever, we would have just never got close to them, not listening to those conversations at all because it's like, well, oh, well, they're not. And they're as good as atheists to, you know, in my, my framework back then. Um, Same in my they, church. Yeah. They're, and it's just such a, it's such a shame, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I went on to work in that chaplaincy and we ended up in a real double bind because we were employed by the university and we had to sign up to to agree to not be homophobic, not be racist, et cetera, et cetera. And that meant that automatically certain Christian groups couldn't engage with us because the rules that they needed chaplains to sign up to completely disagreed with the rules that chaplains had to sign up to for their employment. So it, it means that a lot of chaplain, university chaplaincies in the UK really struggle to function because we're kind of, I guess, hamstrung right from the beginning. And it's weird because if, you know, if you caricature those people, it's like, well, if you want to work with us, then you have to be racist. They'd be like, don't be ridiculous. That's not what we believe. Yeah. But then um, I was wondering, because you obviously encountered a, like a very broad spectrum of of churchmanship. Is that a word? Church personship. Um, uh, is everyone who has a theological objection to queer identity, to trans identity, to um, that kind of stuff. Is everyone, are they always hateful or are there people who are loving in a twisted way, loving but wrong? Can, can, uh, can, um, you, can you even experience it when it's that close to your identity, I guess, is that as well, that kind of separation? So I think, yes. I don't think people are always hateful and certainly the church that I experienced trauma in, I also experienced a lot of love in, and actually in some ways that's the hardest thing, is to have these people who you know really love you, um, and then to realize that they really, not even that they really hate a part of you, because hate's too simplistic a term, but like that they think that part of you is kind of fundamentally flawed. Um, if that came from someone who you actually thought hated you, it would be a lot easier. Um, but coming from people you think love you, it's really hard. But going like beyond that, I think in terms of trans in particular, there are a lot of people who are genuinely loving and genuinely queer accepting, or at least lesbian and gay accepting, um, who have genuine concerns. Um, and it doesn't mean that I think their concerns are necessarily justified, but there's so much kind of misinformation and very, very binary um, one side or another debate that it becomes hard for people to know where to stand. And particularly, I think people who are older and whose use of media sometimes is restricted to print media, for example, or TV. Um, I'm just experiencing a lot of people coming and saying, well, obviously, I completely accept you, but and my initial response, I guess, as a human being is to want to jump on that butt and to be like really stressed about it and annoyed. But then I'm kind of like, but actually they're being sincere. Um, and what they're being told about trans people kind of implies that we're destroying all sorts of important stuff. Um, so I think it's difficult for people to understand what to think at the moment. That's incredibly gracious, um, like, because I think you have every right to get angry and to and to to not, I don't know, to not be that gracious about it. Uh, we, we saw in the UK today or yesterday, uh, Costa Coffee coming under, uh, you know, fire because, was it a, a mural on a van or something? Yeah, of it's like a cartoon on a van or something. A cartoon on a van of somebody drinking coffee who had had top surgery, which is, is that when uh, breasts are removed? That's That's the term. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the kind of informal term that a lot of trans guys use. And I guess um, formally it would be called a mistake to me. Um, but like, yeah, so they had 
hired this trans guy um, to paint their mural for Pride Month. Um, and it's kind of, it's one of those things about art, isn't it? That we often create things that look kind of like us or like the people that we know. And he'd created this person with top surgery. And what was really interesting is that it was kind of immediately read as a political statement on the behalf of Costa. Um, whereas to me, it was kind of making sure that some of the money for Pride Month went to a tra trans artist rather than going to big corporations. It was quite a cool thing for them to do and a little bit different from how they have operated and being criticized for being quite kind of capitalist about the whole thing in the past. Um, and I guess the general outrage is not that surprising to me, but what did frustrate me a bit is that an MP um, kind of said something along the lines of Costa shouldn't be political unless they want to like go into politics. And I think what struck me from that is that trans people's lives are automatically posited as political. You know, if you are a trans person and an artist, or if you're an artist who does art that includes a trans person, then automatically you're assumed to be making a political statement when the reality is you could just be making some art um, and it's quite cool art. And, you know, maybe that's all that it is. Um, so it's the constant kind of claim that everything's political that I think I really struggle with. Because it's not, I mean, it's definitely not party political. No. And I don't really think being trans is issue political either. It's just a way of being. I know trans people who are incredibly conservative about all sorts of things and trans people who are incredibly progressive about all sorts of things and everything in between. We need to find some trans Tories who we can hate for the right reasons. I think that's important. <laughs> I think that's the, but like your, your identity is being and has been by the right turned into the culture wars, um, current favorite battleground that is that psychologically tiring again it's that just your existence is somehow political you know this, this, a trans artist representing someone like themselves is now you know even even if even if they are political like that's got to be exhausting it's just really weird um so like i as I said, came out a long time ago and there wasn't really any visibility. And that meant that some things were really difficult and there were some things you had to fight for and, you know, people didn't automatically recognize you the way that you'd like and things like that. And then things got a lot better. And also I transitioned and I got to a stage where I didn't really feel I needed to talk about being trans all the time. Um, and then it just felt like suddenly that visibility tipped over to being used as a, a kind of political thing. And suddenly it was everywhere. And suddenly it was this big issue. And suddenly it was all anyone wanted to talk about. And like, even like, if I just go sit in a coffee shop now, I feel very likely to overhear a conversation about trans people. And I think when you are trans, the problem is people assume if you don't kind of look trans in inverted commas, whatever that means, that it's fine because you're not affected by those things, but you still have to sit and listen to it or read it every time you go on social media um, or like if you open a newspaper or turn on the TV or overhear someone talking in church, it's just absolutely everywhere. And it kind of becomes that that one thing about you is constantly on your mind because it's constantly brought up and it's usually brought up because people are wondering if it's wrong. So yeah, it can be tiring and also just, a little bit surreal because you just kind of think but i'm just getting on with doing my job which has nothing to do with being trans and all of that kind of stuff i'm literally having a latte <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and i think for me as well the, the other takeaway that i had from that is that i i have a friend who is a cis man who is going to be having top surgery for just like a kind of a, you know non-transgender related medical reason and to see people um being like well you should basically say you shouldn't be portraying these images in in media i was like well for, for i mean obviously horrendous for trans people let's get that straight like that's the main issue here but also that it has that knock-on effect for other people who have you know the physical characteristics or the kind of things like that that are now also being just impacted because you don't think that way they look complies to your idea of gender which is it's just so many more people caught in the crossfire and you know we need to be again we need to be protecting our trans siblings first and foremost this is that's the most important thing but there's just so much knock-on effect that i think people don't really realize from the way that they're acting about this 
Yeah, and also like kind of hysteria about treatments that cis people have with no none of that. Um, most treatments, in fact, I think probably almost every treatment that trans people can have, cis people have for other reasons. Um, so, for example, one of the ones which people have got really irate about are horm horm hormone blockers for young people. To the extent that hormone blockers for trans young people has now been completely stopped in the UK. Um, but uh, children and teenagers are put on hormone blockers in the UK every day for other conditions. Um, and that's seen as completely fine. But as soon as they're trans, it's a problem. Um, so it's kind of concerning and confusing that often, for example, people talk about protecting women, but some of the things they're trying to ban actually endanger women. So for example, we're experiencing at the moment a really real difficulty in getting hold of hormones, um, both estrogen and testosterone, and no one quite knows why. And sometimes people say it's to do with Brexit, but some people think it's because trans-related healthcare has been kind of massively defunded. But the irony is that the biggest user of um, hormones are women who are experiencing the menopause. And they're kind of, there's this big thing where people are saying on social media, oh, I'm really annoyed that I can't get my treatment for the menopause. And then in their next tweet, kind of being <sighs> anti-trans people using hormones. Joking. And it just doesn't add up, really. Yeah. Yeah. That is absolutely insane. I, I, um, there's a, there's a question that I want to ask about um, the young people and and those kind of puberty blockers uh, as they get called. I think in the mainstream media, which is just like, do you, that does feel controversial. And and you know you just need to do a little bit of a Google and realize oh this is all entirely reversible it's not doing irreversible stuff anyway so if you're out there listening and you're like well you can't give a child you know things that would you know prevent puberty happening it's fine it it can be reversed most of those effects are you know all that kind of stuff but like can you see can you see why they're stressed out about it and do you have any sympathy for that and what would you say to somebody who had good faith concerns. So I think there are several kind of points to make. One of the points is that the media often is quite intentionally controversial in the way it talks about children and transition. So it will often couch things in the terms of children transitioning, implying clinical transition, and also in terms of children having irreversible hormones. And I have even seen media articles in the UK saying children having irreversible surgery. Um, and neither of those two things are currently legal in the UK. So in the UK, currently, you can't have hormones or surgery till you're 16. And it's really rare to have surgery until you're 18. And even once you're 18, the waiting lists are so, so long at the moment that unless you're very, very wealthy, you're not going to have um, surgery until you're a lot older than that. So I think that's the first thing I'd say is don't be concerned that children are getting given hormones and surgery because they literally aren't. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. And I, I it would be possible to go into all of the ways in which children are given hormones and surgery for other things unnecessarily, but that's probably slightly off topic. But I think it's important to realize that it's not happening in this case. In terms of hormone blockers, I think what I'd want to help people to do, I guess, is to compare it to other clinical treatments and to think about it in that sense, because one of the things that people get concerned about about hormone blockers, which I really do understand, is some of the things that are not known. Um, but every medication that we use currently, there are things that aren't known. And I think sometimes in sensitive topics like around hormone blockers, that's overemphasized in order to suggest that this medication is somehow different to others, um, but it really isn't. And then secondly, I'd also want people to just really take time to look at what hormone blockers actually do. Um, so, for example, people are often really concerned about children and young people not having time to mature emotionally, which they see as being a part of puberty. But actually, hormone blockers, when they're not used for trans people, are used predominantly when a young person is actually having quite an extreme emotional reaction um, to increase in hormone levels. And they're used to create that space and time and kind of calmness and centeredness um, for young people to develop. So it's, I would want people to understand that it's not like just pausing young people at age 12 or 13 or whatever. 
It's about removing a very, very strong chemical reaction that happens in young people's bodies that for some young people is not appropriate and causes really severe mental health difficulties, one of which is gender dysphoria, but there are all sorts of other reasons that they're used too. And I think just doing some research into that might reassure people because I think there's an assumption that it's going to really change people's personalities in a negative way. Whereas the reality is that one of the biggest side effects of hormone blockers is that they're calming. Um, and I don't think people know that. So I understand the concerns, but I wish the media was giving people some of that information instead of kind of fueling those concerns. I'm going to ask a radical question for this podcast because I was always get sidelined for um, being a breeder and actually having real children. Shut up! <laughs> get off the podcast! <laughs> so <laughs> how can I be a good dad to my kids growing up? Like with... Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, or maybe not obviously, <laughs> I'm trying to be an ally, trying to be progressive from where I've come from, but where I've come from is very, you know, um, stereotypical ideas about gender and just um, what's, what's the kind of, feel free to tell me to read a book, but <laughs> um, what are the kind of the key, key ideas that I can be kind of um, modeling to my kids? So. I guess I kind of want to start by saying that I don't have kids and I want to be humble about that and be like, I, I don't know how to tell you how to parent. On the other hand... Um, Feel free to tell him how to parent. <laughs> today, fine. as part of my job, um, I was meeting with a trans guy who's just had a baby and I was meeting his baby for the first time um, and I got to feed his baby and I've never, like, I've always found that a little bit odd I guess because mostly it's been heterosexual couples that I know who've had babies and I felt a little bit distanced from it and feeling actually that I could be part of this kid's queer family that were kind of happy to just raise him to be whoever he is um, felt really powerful and I guess what I was thinking in that moment was about radical acceptance and his dad said something like oh I really hope he isn't trans by which he meant it's really difficult to be trans um, but then he said, but we'll accept you if you are, it's fine. And I think for me, I guess I hope that parents can just accept whatever their kids say, even if it seems odd, if it's not like actively putting them in harm's way. Like if they say they're about to go stand in the fire, maybe tell them not to. Um, but within the realms of possibility, actually to just kind of have that radical acceptance, I think really helps kids to explore. And the likelihood is that they'll turn around and say so that there's something else the next day, and that's okay too. I think one of the real fears around children is what if they change their mind? Um, and I think my advice is to kind of try to think, so what? Because actually, if the world's progressing in the way it seems like it is when I'm feeling positive about things, um, hopefully it won't matter. You know, if a child does come out as trans or gay or changes their career path or whatever it is, I don't think it's going to matter in the same way that it, that it did at some points. I mean, I know kids who've transitioned and then re-transitioned um, and I've spoken to their peers about it. I've, I go into schools a lot to do training and advice with teachers and their peers will just say, oh well, yeah, they thought they were a girl and then they thought they were a boy and now they think they're a girl again. And like, they don't care. Um, there is no kind of issue Um for peers. So I think we have that possibility to just accept kids when they say who they are and that gives them the opportunity to find out if that's true or not. And if it's not, that's cool. And if it is, that's cool. That's very cool. I love that. Even just the reference to career, like <laughs> there's not the panic or even moral panic around like, well, there might be, you know, I want to be a police officer. What the fuck? Like, you know, <laughs> no son of mine. <laughs> yeah. no, but you, kind of, you would you would oh that's brilliant tell me about that that's interesting that's fine let's go with that and see and then yeah next week if it's something different that's cool tell me about that you know just just walking with them on the journey mm -hmm. that's really cool um so you you said a bunch of stuff there that um i know i'm going to have a conversation with my mother-in-law who is a very lovely christian lady who really wants to understand and be an ally and inform herself and all that kind of stuff. And I know she's going to call me and say, okay, but 
like what what do these terms mean you know like transitioning because especially for me like you know solidly gen x not a millennial um like we our exposure to any kind of transgender stuff was when somebody had had full surgery that mm. was what counted and up until then it was just what you wanted like can can you help us understand some of the terminology and the the, the stuff around that yeah absolutely so trans um itself has been used as short for all sorts of words um but now even in most dif- dictionaries it's just written as trans um and that's because it's an umbrella term that means that lots of different terms come under it and kind of describes all sorts of people um, who identify differently than their gender um, assigned at birth. That term gender assigned at birth is sometimes complex for people, um, but it's important to remember that when people see a baby and say it's a boy or it's a girl, they're not able to see their internal organs or their chromosomes or to know what their gender identity will be. Um, so trans simply means you live in some way other than, or you experience in some way other than your, your gender assigned at birth. That could mean transitioning medically and or socially or not. And the thing about transitioning and kind of defining that is that it means something different to everyone. Um, transitioning used to very much mean going from A to Z. Um, going from being seen as completely female, um, in my case, to completely male, um, and kind of taking a set number of social and medical steps to reach that. And I think that's partly because non-binary identities weren't as visible, but it was also partly because of the medical pathway um, that that was insisted on up until about five years ago. Um, So the medical pathway used to assume that everyone would come out, everyone would live in role for a period of a year, and then you would be prescribed hormones, and then you would have top surgery, which is chest surgery if you're a trans man, and then you would have lower surgery or genital surgery. And it was kind of a straightforward pathway that was assumed that most people would go on to to the extent that I found it quite difficult to be discharged from the gender service because they were like, but you're not finished. And I was like, yes, but that's fine. Um, And so we've moved from a time where a lot of people would say I have transitioned to a time where a lot more people say I'm transitioning or I'm in transition. And those are the, the kind of language that I try to use when I remember. And I guess to me, that's partly about the fact that not everyone has all the treatments. Um, and that can be for all sorts of reasons. It can be because some people are non-binary, but it can also be things like um, lower surgery, particularly for trans masculine people. So people transitioning in the same direction as me is that it's actually not often very good. Um, and that some of us just feel the surgery is not at a standard that we want to have it. For other people, their dysphoria, which is discomfort around that stuff is so extreme that they will have it. And, you know, there are all sorts of different reasons for all of these decisions. Um, But for me, there's kind of a faith thing in it as well. So for me, I don't ever want to imply that my knowledge of myself or my journeying with myself is complete, because to me, that implies that I know more than God. Um, I don't know who I'm going to be tomorrow. That's up to God and who they call me to be. Um, And so, for example, when people use terms like detransition, which is used to refer to people who transition back, either back partially to a kind of non-binary identity or back to their previous gender, actually, for me, that shouldn't be a problem. For me, like, it's a journey and I can't say who I'm going to be tomorrow. And maybe I'll want to identify in a different way. And I don't know why that would be a problem. I think you can only live for where you are now. Um, So for me, that sense of continued transition is a sense of continuing to listen to God and continuing to grow as a person and to recognize that that will change. I I don't know if that answered your question. or That really did. And I, I, I just, uh, when you were talking about the, the body dysphoria, I just think that must be so unbelievably painful to have to live with and people often often talk about um oh but it's such a painful procedure you know and and kind of that as an anti-transitioning argument but the 
the psychological pain of not feeling like your body is your own or yeah i i mean i can't imagine it yeah i mean i have two relatively severe phobias that i've had for my whole life and one of them is sickness like as in vomiting and the other one is needles um and a couple of years ago i had a hysterectomy related to being trans and it's one of the surgeries that you're most likely to be sick from um and i really considered not doing it but i had to and similarly with needles i now self-inject once every three weeks with one of the biggest types of needles that anyone can use um and it's i i couldn't imagine doing it but i can't imagine not doing it and i think that's how serious dysphoria is and i don't think I don't think people understand the steps that we're willing to take and that it's not kind of something you would just do lightly. It's actually really, really hard at every stage. But if you take those steps, it's because you need to. Absolutely. Um, I want to come on to the theology and maybe a little bit of scripture and that sort of stuff. But I realized that we have, well, Laura reminded me because I'm an idiot and I forget, but that we haven't actually done drinks, um, which is, you know, we can't call it beer Christianity unless somebody is, you know, talking about what they're drinking. So, uh, <laughs> Laura, what are you drinking? Back on the old faithful, my Jack and Coke. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, enough said. Melks? Your it's mic's on off. mute, like a yeah. mute wanker. What an idiot. <laughs> um, well, my uh, volume percent was the same as my alcohol percentage, which is zero. Um, oh. Does that make sense? Oh. <laughs> zero percent Oh, alcohol. your volume. I thought the volume was oh, the same. Uh, I was terrible. just like, is this another thing I don't so understand? Bad. <laughs> <laughs> a zero percent alcohol beer, alcohol free beer. <laughs> There's a pilsner of some kind. <laughs> My wife found an Aldi, I believe. Okay. Aldi's <laughs> always got they've always got fun names. What's the name? Rheinbacher. Well, that's not I just sounds like American football. Yeah. Mm. Uh I'm drinking Brewdog Brewdog Elvis juice, but I was drinking Hogan's rich, decadent, and bittersweet libertine cider, which was not good. Um oh. yeah, sadly. <laughs> I mean, the name. Drinking um Heretic by nice. Nordic, which is quite ironic, but not intentional. <laughs> Brilliant. Which is beer. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, so let's talk theology, because you were keen to talk about the theology of it. Um, a lot of the people who object to, it seems, the existence of trans people at all seem to have a kind of a theological objection along the lines of male and female, he created them, or a kind of broader theological perspective that is, but God created you this way, God doesn't make mistakes. Can you speak to those and other uh, arguments that you hear theologically? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess on those arguments, it's kind of, so I always find this really difficult because I'm very much not an advocate for everyone needs to do loads of academic study. Um, and I always feel really tempted to say that everyone needs to learn Hebrew at this point. But actually, I don't really think that. What I think is that people need to understand how complicated Hebrew is and need to understand that they probably can't understand it because I can't understand it. None of us can understand it. But Hebrew has very few words. So like loads less words than English. And that means that every word is really creative um, and every lesson is really creative. Um, so Hebraic teaching tends to include a lot of hyperbole, a lot of rhetoric, a lot of exaggeration um, and a lot of telling of stories. Um, and that doesn't lessen the truthfulness of it. If anything, it makes it even more true and even more deep. But what it does mean is that there's no such thing as a literal reading because every Hebrew word can mean about a hundred different things. Um, so you cannot pin it down and say, this is what it means. And it's one of the, for me, tragedies of Christianity that, that we sometimes try to do that. Um, Judaism does not try to do that. And it's a real shame that we haven't learned um, from that. So in terms of Genesis, I think the two kind of Genesis stories answer those two critiques differently. So. Genesis 1, to me, really answers that critique of God made man and woman, because it can just as easily be read, God created them in their image, masculine to feminine, God created them, 
there's no reason for it to kind of be man on the one end and woman on the other end. That's in part because the words used for what is traditionally um, man and woman sound much more like a kind of um, adjective form. So it's descriptive language. It's more like masculinity, femininity than a kind of substance language around being physically male or female. But it's also that and in the middle and that a lot gets loaded onto that word and for a start, even in a basic English sense, and doesn't have to mean totally separated. Like it could mean male and female in one creature. Yeah. Um, and when I come on to Genesis 2, that will make a bit more sense. Um, but also in Hebrew, there's one word. It's actually one letter. It's called the Vav consecutive, and it looks a bit like a crooked finger. And that one letter is used for every single joining word. So and, if, or, but, then... Um, absolutely any word that joins two clauses is just that one letter. And I love there is nothing... male but female, you know, like that's Quite. great. That's, you know, yeah. like, okay. There's literally nothing to qualify or explain what, what it's being used to mean. So the fact that we load so much onto that word, which we literally don't know what it means, I find really interesting. But then secondly with that, in Genesis 2, um, the human is constantly referred to as the human. So it's this term ha-adam, the human, which is the same term used in Genesis 1. And it's not until that kind of cosmic surgery thing where the human gets separated in two that it suddenly changes to gender. So before then, it's always ha-adam, and then suddenly it's ish and isha. And that's often used to kind of subjugate women by saying, oh, it's the man saying, this is a woman that was created out of me. But it can just as easily be read to kind of say that the the man looking in the mirror kind of only recognizes himself as man in seeing this other creature. So there's this sense in which the human can very much be read as this creature that contains both male and female until yeah. that moment. But the second thing that I would want to say about that is about that second objection, which is the idea that God doesn't make mistakes and that God doesn't change God's creation because that Genesis 2 story is the earliest narrative in the Bible of God changing God's mind. And we mm. get them throughout the Bible, and it's really heretical to say, but it's there in black and white. And in Genesis 2, it's this whole thing about Ha'adam, the human, having to name all of the animals and the implication that they're supposed to find a life partner amongst all of these animals. And it says but the human couldn't find any creature that mirrored them. And the human goes and tells God this, and God says, oh, okay, and then does something new. God changes what God creates because God realizes that something's wrong. And, and it's that collaborative thing that God does with humanity the whole way through the scripture. Exactly. God's constantly, and I know like philosophically we don't think God can change, but God outside of time can hold all of that difference within God's self, and that's really exciting. Um, so, I, yeah, I just don't get how how we struggle to see it when it's it's there in black and white. Um, God changes God's mind for Ha'adam, for the human, and creates this creature. And that word of mirroring as well, it's not all about distinction. In the Hebrew, it very much reads as that there wasn't another creature that mirrored them. And then when the woman is created, it's, and then um, the human found a mirroring partner. It's the kind of language that's used, which is so often translated as helpmate, which is just nothing like mirroring partner. Yeah. Um, a... So I wish we played more with the Hebrew, really. Okay. Have you, this is, this is not an important question. I'd just like to put that out there right now. But have you ever, when somebody talks to you who you don't know that well, and you want to mess with them and they say, listen, but when you, when you look at the Hebrew, do you ever stop them and go, they brew? <laughs> ah, dead serious look in your eyes. Just <laughs> stare them down. <laughs> like, just, Are you sure you're not a pre Because That was kind of a dad joke. To be honest. <laughs> Honestly, I have the best part of being a breeder, which is the dad jokes. That is like, that is my, honestly, that's the best like, part. I don't even have to have children. It's fantastic. It's just something. The pun game in, is strong. Oh, it's all about it, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> um, 
but other theological kind of objections that you hear or arguments that you hear from good faith and bad faith, the kinds of things that, that somebody listening to this might have heard. So I get quite a lot of stuff about being created in God's image, which is the stuff that I find most interesting because to me, I mean, you could both talk about that in the sense of that Genesis where it, one of the things we can unambiguously say about the Hebrew in Genesis 1 is that God is described in the plural. So if we're created in God's image, it's humanity as a whole that's created in God's image. So there's already that gender play of, of both men and women, as well as non-binary people being created in God's image. So God's image is automatically beyond the binary um, and contains all of that difference in gender. But I think it then gets really interesting when you start to think about Jesus. And I guess sometimes I just want to say to people, what if Jesus is trans? Um, and there are multiple levels of that. One is simply that God becoming human goes through a kind of transition, a kind of change that's not about gender, but it's about substance and who and what and where God is changes in a really radical way that makes it really difficult for people to recognize God as God. It was harder for people to recognize Jesus as God because he was substantially different. And I think that's a kind of interesting experience. But then when we kind of move into the body of Christ, there's a logical necessity that the body of Christ is trans. It's there throughout um, Paul's theology um, that the body of Christ contains, I guess, in Paul, all believers, in my mind, all people. And if the body of Christ contains all believers or all people, then that means that the body of Christ contains people of all genders, people of all sexualities, people of all abilities, people of all skin tones. There's this necessary queerness and ambiguity and creativity and what it means to be the body of Christ. And I think if trans people can't be seen as being made in the image of God, then I struggle to understand what that whole body of Christ thing is. So I find that really interesting and exciting. And I guess, I guess I understand why people struggle with trans people from a biblical perspective but i think often often i feel sympathy for people because i really want them to feel able to really engage with scripture in a really personal way and to really wrestle with the narratives in there and to really try to to grapple with what they mean for them as individuals and i think often our understandings of the bible are about what we've been told to think it means including what i'm saying now you know i'm effectively telling people what i think it means and what i want to be clear about is that that shouldn't or doesn't need to be what listeners think it means for me the whole point is that christianity is about a relationship and that's actually quite a conservative concept um that christianity is actually about your relationship with god and if that's true then every single one of us is going to have a different relationship you know, each of us in this um, online room that have a different way of relating to each other person and a different personal history with each other. Each person listening has a different relationship full of people in their lives. And the same goes for God and for the Bible. And I'd rather that instead of using the Bible to proof text and to kind of create these moral norms that we were able to have that in-depth relationship where we're really saying, but what does this mean? And being curious about it. Um, and that's what I want for people, not not because it'll help them to understand trans people, but because it's nice. Like, yeah. it's a fun thing to do. It, it, it's good to be able to have that relationship. At, as sons and or the bride, you know, which is, yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah just quickly on the end of just reading or thinking about Genesis, like embracing a more 
I don't know, playing with the literature, playing with the story, discussing, chewing it over, like makes much more sense of how it's written, especially <laughs> how you talk about, you know, uh, Adam trying to find a partner amongst the animals. Like, <laughs> do we think that, like, do you think that literally played out or do you think that's, you know, telling a story for it's to funny make us did. think? <laughs> it's funny if it did. Would have taken a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and yeah, for me, because there's lots of issues that I can put put my kind of old uh, fundamentalist ske- um, spectacles on and sort of see the the thinking, but um, yeah, the trans issues I, gen- I genuinely am baffled by because I think I don't see how it's a Christian issue for so many of the kind of evangelicals to again defend. I'm doing <laughs> doing air quotes for the listener, but. Um, um, do you think it's a kind of weird issues around sexuality that that are kind of um, overlaid on on so much of the Bible? Um, because if you weren't obsessed with being homophobic, then I don't see how you know it makes any difference to how how especially these days that it's kind of smaller and smaller groups of Christians believe there are kind of. Uh, fundamental uh, gender role kind of separations um so uh, yeah sorry i think there's a question in there somewhere yeah um so i think on kind of why sexual i i think there are different things at play and i think it is weird that there's a kind of obsession with sexuality i guess so i kind of have a lot of anti-capitalist feelings and one of the things I always think about is means of control and means of production Um, and sexuality is often thought of as a means of production particularly in bible terms and particularly in hebrew scripture terms Um, in one of my lectures described the hebrew scriptures approach to sexuality I think unfairly but described it as basically being about farmyard politics that it's about power and money it's about how many sons you have um because that's how your line continues and that's what's important in that worldview and i think i think there's a sense of that continuing i think there's a sense in which who has power and control um and how is quite important in church and one of the ways that's played out is through family lines um and kind of losing those heteronormative ways of being in society um means that the church loses some of what used to be its role, um, particularly in society in certain parts of America. Um, You know, the church's function has been to uphold particular types of family values, and it's having to realize that maybe that shouldn't be its function um, or can't be. And I think there's a lot of fear around that. Um, But being less generous, I also now just think it's just being used as a political wedge issue. both in church and in public life more widely. Um, I think all LGBT identities are, but I think trans identities are even more. Um, And I think it's just an easy topic to use as a wedge issue, in part because there are so few trans people, um, in part because um, it's easy to ridicule people who are visibly seen as other. Um, and in part because we rely on public support. You can't transition in isolation. Um, so I think it's it's now become a convenient wedge issue, um, and there isn't, I think in the way it's blown up, there isn't a whole lot of logic to. I think there's some logic to some of the arguments, um, but the kind of hysteria over it, when you consider what a small percentage of people you're talking about, um, I mean, people just shouldn't really care. They probably have other things to worry about, really. What can Christians be doing in those in those spaces to make lives better for trans people? I think a large part of it is to speak out. I know lots of Christians who are totally fine with trans people, but who just don't talk about it. I think because it's become such a wedge issue and such a culture war thing, they think it's better to just not talk about it. But The problem is that makes it easier for people to say that all Christians have a problem with trans people. 
Um, and I think particularly to talk about the fact that there are different interpretations of scripture, because what I constantly hear is that people like me just aren't engaging with scripture. Um, that's what I hear in the church. And that's problematic because as you've probably heard, I engage with scripture to a geeky level. Um, but then like, secondly, outside of the church, that actually I think a lot of transphobia is based on biblical understandings because it's based on the idea that there is only man and woman and that idea isn't scientific. So the only logical base for it is from the Bible. So I want Christians to to say there are other ways of thinking about this publicly so that, so that, yeah, that, that kind of norm doesn't just keep perpetuating. Um, and also just think a bit about gendered language because a little bit of me dies every time someone says brother and sister because I'm like, oh, not me. Mm-hmm. And I know I could be generous and just decide it includes me, but you can't help what you feel. I think anyone who has listened to this podcast could not in good conscience say you've not been engaging with scripture. And I'd also like to point out that while Alex was explaining uh, Hebrew to us, he was miming the shape of the letters with his fingers <laughs> to show us what they meant. That's yeah. how deep he is into this, guys. <laughs> yeah, we've had some scripture nerds sorry. on this podcast, but like, I don't know, this is all other level. This is like... <laughs> Um, uh, we, we've got to wrap up because we're a little bit over time, but um, I was wondering about uh, the uh, uh, trans media. Are there bands, are there films, are there books that you could recommend to people so that they can understand the experience, have a better, um, at what's, what's good, not just in terms of what's like, you know, worthy and, and interesting and all that kind of stuff, but what's, what's good that's out there? Yeah. Um, so if you like kind of, RT novels. Um, there's a book called The Argonauts. It's by a woman called Maggie Nelson, whose partner is a trans person. Um, and she's just really writing in a kind of novel form, but it's about her kind of experience of her partner transitioning and how that's affected her experience of gender. And it's just really um, empathetic and emotional and yeah, I defy anyone to not be kind of carried along um, by the emotion. It's, it's, it is political, but not like on the surface, actually. It's just a really good novel. Um, so I think that that could be really helpful. If you want something more explicitly political, there's a book called The Transgender Issue by someone called Sean Fay, which talks about how trans and capitalism and racism and colonialism and all sorts of different um, issues to do with social hierarchies and structures are intertwined and talks about how dismantling um, gender norms can help to dismantle some of those other systems of oppression, um, which is really, really helpful. Um, So yeah, I'd say those are kind of the top two, but also just to look out for trans creatives. So the person behind the Costa Van thing, who interestingly is rarely named in the articles, even though a photo of his work is used, is Fox Fisher. Um, he's a fairly well-known trans artist. Um, but there are loads of people out there, like literally just Google trans artist, and there are people creating great art. Great stuff. Um, uh, I guess the uh, final thing is, if people want to find out more about you, about your ministry, uh, where can they where can they do that? Point them to your your thinkings. Yep, so I've got a website, which I think is alexclareyoung.co.uk. Um, but again, it's relatively Googleable. Um, and then my ministry um, is with something called Cambridge Solidarity Hub. And that's at solidarityhub.co.uk. Um, and is not all about trans stuff, but it's about other cool stuff. Um, so please do follow that as well. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for listening to Beer Christianity. You can get in touch with us with uh, your thoughts and with questions at beerchristianity at yahoo.com because we is Yahoo nerds. And you can also find us on Insta. You can find us on the platform formerly known as Twitter. You can find... Yeah, you can find us anywhere. It's fine. So get in touch with us. Let us know what you think. And um, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.